I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. This month, we'll be discussing a part of our local ecosystem that's essential but often undervalued, Michigan's spiders. Our guest is Dr. Cara Shillington, professor and researcher at Eastern Michigan University, who specializes in spiders and other arachnids. Dr. Shillington, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So when we talk about environmental protection, we often think of the charismatic megafauna, the polar bears, the bald eagles, the beautiful butterflies, but we often really seldom hear about spiders. And I know that they are essential to our ecosystem. And tell, tell us why. So essentially, amongst the invertebrate group, spiders are some of the top predators. So you find them in literally all environments. And they are eating just about everything else. So all of the things that we consider pests, all of the insects, they eat a lot of insects. Some of the agricultural pests, they also eat some of the insects that are some of the biting insects that, that we don't like as well. And if we didn't have these animals within the the ecosystem playing their role as predators, we would see a lot more of these types of pest animals and an explosion of some of the, the invertebrate species. Hmm. And I've seen pictures of birds with spiders in their mouths. They must be prey for some Oh, there. absolutely. So there are lots of different things that also feed on spiders. So spiders themselves will actually eat other spiders. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are afraid of spiders, you can find some of the ones that eat other ones, and they'll eat all of the ones in your house. Um, they, birds are also a problem. And this is one of the, when you look at some of those spider webs, and so with some of the stable omentum, which is um, like the, the zipper spider, which has that, that area in the middle of its web, it's thought that this is actually something that camouflages it from spiders or, or from, from birds or prevents birds from flying through the, the webs. But probably some of the biggest predators on spiders are wasps. Oh, really? So there are a lot of wasps that will actually pick spiders right out of their webs. Hmm. Gosh, I've never seen that before. So, yeah, they, they call them the spider hawk. Oh, yeah. Wasps. Huh. Yeah. Um, and spiders are, some of them are scavengers too, so they clean up um, debris in terms of a, to a little, not okay. very many of them. So most spiders actually eat living prey. So they okay. will not um, take any prey that is already dead. So it is very unusual. Typically, the, the detritivores or, or the organisms that will eat already dead prey are some of the, the harvestmen or the daddy long legs. Oh, but yeah. they are not actually spiders. They are arachnids. They have the, the eight legs. Um, but they have a single body part instead of the two body parts that we typically associate with, with spiders. And those are the ones that, that typically will eat dead and de decaying matter. But most of the spiders will only eat living prey. And part of it is associated with their actual prey capture. So they are attracted to things that are moving. Um, and that's how they capture their prey, whether it's in a web or whether they are ambush spiders. They're attracted to that movement of the, the living organism. Hmm. So they have to be pretty skilled at catching prey. And they have all different kinds of ways of doing it. Uh, and sometimes they use uh, silk. Do you want to tell us about some right. of the different ways? So, so typically, all spiders spin silk, but not all of them use it directly for prey capture. So typically, when we think about spiders, we think about the beautiful orb web spiders. And very clearly, they are using the, those webs for, for prey capture. And actually, one of the fun things with this is that you can actually, if you want to supplemental feed them, you can actually put prey into their web. Really? And they will expand the web in the area where that prey prey is being captured. So, so they, it's very plastic. They can change the shape and size of that web depending on the number of, of prey that, that they get. So, so that is very common. Um, and typically with the orb web spiders, what we see is within that orb web, they have a special type of silk that is actually glue or sticky um, mm -hmm. that helps to, to trap the prey. But actually, not all spiders have that. So some of the other types of, of spiders, even though they spin silk, it doesn't have that sticky um, web with it. So they have to use different types of, of mechanisms to actually capture their, their prey. And then there's some spiders that don't use the web at all. And, and there's uh, lots of different types of ambush spiders. Mm -hmm. And so they literally are sneaking up on um, small invertebrates and just grabbing them there as they are moving without using any sort of, of web. There are also other webs that are just kind of detective um, platforms. So some of the funnel weavers that we see, we, we 
see those flat sheets of, of web. Oh, yeah, Very you see often, those on shrubs a lot. Right. Yeah. And there's a funnel where the, the spider is found, but those webs actually don't have much for sticky silk on it. And it really is the, the spider just feels the, the prey movement as it comes onto that web and it rushes out and grabs the, the prey, oh, but the I web see. doesn't necessarily um, stick to so or it's immobilize sort of a the prey. sensory detection device. Right. Hmm. right. Interesting. Um, we went on a walk with you at the Mathai Botanical Gardens. It was a field trip with the Washington Audubon Society. Right. It was fascinating. And we saw a lot of different kinds of webs that day. You pointed out I never would have noticed them before. Um, how about the bowl and doily? Those are interesting. Right. That's one of my favorites because it's so easy to recognize and there isn't any other type of spider that has the, this type of web. And essentially, like the, the name implies, there's actually a bowl shape of the web and then underneath it there is the doily part and really the the bowl shape um, extends up and again this is not sticky web but as the insect flies into it it gets entangled in all of the strands of the web and the spider is actually very small and some of the time um, it's very difficult to see the spider but the web is very characteristic and the spider when it feels the prey entering the the web and flapping around wi within the web it shakes the bowl on the underside and this causes the insect to kind of fall down towards the bottom and then the, huh. the spider will grab it um, wow. at the bottom. So, so we see lots of variation in the, the different types of web that, that spiders can build. And so there's the, the bowl-shaped one and then there's another one that's fairly common that's actually a filmy dome. And so it's the actual opposite of it where it actually forms a dome hmm. and the spider is at the top of the dome. And so you'll see those also typically in, in the woods as, as well. Uh, when I was little, of course, one of my favorite books was Charlotte's Web, and the um, little babies, once they left, they, they went off on a string of silk. Right. And I was reading in this book um, you, that you gave out during our walk, which is awesome. It's uh, Common Spiders of Ohio Field Guide, and um, it says in there that the uh, spiders are often the first thing to colonize new areas such as like where volcanoes have erupted or whatever because they fly in. They, they balloon in. So yeah, so and they can travel amazing distances with with this ballooning. So so typically the, these young spiders will move to the top of a shrub or wherever they, their nest have, have been and they'll stand with their abdomen up in the air and they'll spin a little loop of silk and as the wind comes by it will take them up and travel long distances. And there was a very interesting study that was done where people actually collected spiders using an airplane with a net behind it. And they actually found in the upper atmosphere spiders that were ballooning. So they can tra travel really amazing distances wow. just with this ballooning. Huh. And another thing I read was that uh, spiders' um, webs is, is, are stretchy, some of them anyway. Right and that um, hummingbirds will collect the spider webs and line their nests with it, and then as the babies grow, it'll be expa expand? Right, so, so, so very cool. often a lot of that is also related to the amount of humidity that, mm. that is in the air, and so the stretchiness of that spider web is really related very often to, to the amount of humidity that, that is in the air, and so there have been lots of, there, there's several different groups that have been studying the, the strength of some of the, the spider web and also the stretchiness of that that spider web and, and very often by man manipulating the amount of humidity in the air you can really see the differences in, in how far this this web can stretch. I was out in the woods the other day and I saw um, a spider web and it was a very windy day and that web was just intact it was blowing like a parachute but it wasn't ripping I guess it's super strong stuff. Right. right, and it's a combination of both the strength of that and also the fact that it is stretchy. And, and yeah. the same, this is very important for that prey capture because as the, the insect flies into the, the prey, if it breaks, the insect's going to be able to escape very easily with all of the, just by moving around. Mm -hmm. And so by having that stretchiness, it, it enables the, the prey not to be able to, to get away. And instead, the movement of the prey very often entangles it more within that web. Um, when I read Charlotte's Web, I was uh, impressed as a little girl how um, nurturing a mother Charlotte was towards her babies. Um, and of course, I thought, well, that's not really true. It's just fictional. But um, then uh, it turns out that there are some spiders that 
that do take care of their young, right? Right. So and there's, a, there's really a wide variety, again, of the amount of care that, that different spiders give. And so there's a whole range of what, from what we consider truly social animals that, that are sharing um, caregiving. Um, but most of the spiders that we find around here, the common ones that, that we see are the nursery web spiders. And, and literally, that name comes from the idea that they actually build a nursery web and they lay their, their eggs. Actually, they, they first of all, carry the eggs around with them. So they have a big egg That's sack that they carry did, around. Um, and then as it gets close to the time of hatching, they build this nursery web and place that egg sack within the, the nursery web. And then the spiderlings all hatch out with, within this nursery. And the mother actively guards it. So you can see this big mass of, of little spiderlings. And the mother will be pretty close by. And if you touch, sometimes if you even just touch that web, she will come up to see what the, the disturbances <laughs> are and chase away any sort of, of predators. And they will stay within that web um, until they molt. And then they will actually crawl to the top of it and the edges of it and, and produce that little silk thread. And they balloon away from, mm. from the maternal nest. Mm. Uh, and apparently attracting a mate is uh, something that some of the spiders are quite uh, elaborate about. Oh, the, the stories with, with mate attraction is just amazing. And again, one of the things when you're considering spiders is, is considering what is the, the, the main sensory mechanism. So some spiders see very, very well. And so a lot of the, the courtship is, is very visual, um, whereas other spiders don't see well at all. And so then for them, a lot of the, the courtship is vibratory. Uh, and again, there is a huge amount of, of variation that, that is associated with that. And one of the important things is that any time two spiders are meeting, the most important thing is that the male makes it very clear that he is not a prey item. And so that's what a lot of courtship oh. is associated with. It is this recognition that this is a mate and, and not a, a prey item. And so they do such a wide variety of different types of leg movements. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's a spider on a web, different types of shaking of the, the web. They're very likely some sort of pheromones that, that are associated with, with it as well. But there have been some very interesting studies that um, they, they have actually looked at. Spiders will respond to, to videos of spiders. So you can look to see what are the characteristics that the female is choosing by manipulating an image on a screen. So wow. if the male is using his legs and, and doing some sort of waving movement, you can make the, the legs, some of them have lots of hairs on those legs, so you can make those hairs larger or smaller, and you can look to see specifically oh. what the female what is, is responding to. Interesting. Wow. A lot of different kinds of uh, research that could go on. Just never think about it. Right. And then there's the whole um, subject of camouflaging. A lot of them do. Right. Right, and so you know, for a lot of these, the ambush spiders that that are tend to be moving around looking for for those prey items, um, a lot of them they either have to sneak up on prey or they're waiting for that prey to come to them. So they really want to blend very well uh, with their background, and so there's a lot of variety there. One of my favorites are the the crab spiders, and if you ever go and look for them, uh, they can sometimes be difficult to see because they can actually, to a slight extent, change their color to match wow. some of the background of the the flower. And so usually it's a, cha a slight change between white and, and um, yellow with a, with a little bit of green. And so these are, in, these are spiders that are very typically catching bees or, or any si type of pollinators that, oh, that are coming. coming to the flowers. Right. Interesting. And these ones have very powerful venom for their, their prey items because um, they don't have a web to capture that prey. And very often they are capturing mm. prey items that are a lot bigger than they are. So they need to be able to paralyze their prey prey very quickly because if they're catching something like a, a bee or a bumblebee or a wasp, these are insects that can potentially damage or kill the spider itself. So it wants to be able to, to paralyze that insect very, very quickly. So, so mm. a lot of the venom components are associated with some sort of paralytic effect that, that very quickly impacts the, the insects that they are eating. Hmm. A humane way to do it. Right. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so. Okay, so gosh, my thought just went out of my head. Um, oh, 
Well, let's go to the largest spider. What is the largest spider? In Michigan, the largest one that we get is the um, is is one of the fishing spiders. So, mm -hmm. so we have these gorgeous big spiders that are typically associated with water, but they can actually be found quite a distant from the wa the water. These are so they they several common names here. So, so the fishing spider is also the nursery web spider, oh. um, but we get one that is really very large um, around here. And so, if you ever see her. With her egg sac, she can look pretty fierce out there. But that is really the, the biggest one. And a lot of people mistake the, the fishing spiders also for wolf spiders, which look very similar. But really, if you get something that is very, very large, it's going it's to be the fishing spider. Big. I've seen really? one with leg spans that, wow. that really can, can be that large. Huh. So it really is a very, when it's stretched out. Okay. Um, and one of the things with the fishing spiders, the reason that they are called fishing spiders, is that these ones are associated w w with water. and they actually hunt within the water and they can feel the vibration of the fishes or, or tadpoles under the water and they will actually dive into the water wow. and actually capture prey um, in the water. How do they not drown? So they actually, um, the, this one in particular ha holds a bubble of air over it. So it has the, its lungs on its abdomen and so essentially it, it creates a bubble of air over the, those lungs so that there's still some oxygen so that it, it can actually breathe um, underwater or, or have some exchange of, of gases underwater. But again, it, it's a very short period. They're literally diving into the water and popping straight up, but they do keep those lungs covered. It must be fun so. to watch. Have you ever seen it? I ha so, so most of the ones that, that I see, again, there's a variety of different fishing spiders. And some of the ones that I see most regularly, there's one called a six-spotted uh, fishing spider. And they're fairly small, but they are all over the surface of the water. Yeah. And some of the things where, when I teach my, my spider class, you know, we're trying to capture some of these so that the students can get a, a close look at them. And they're very difficult to catch because they constantly, as you come by, they're diving into the water. And mm. so they're very difficult to, to capture once they go into the water. So you have to watch for where they're popping up and try and grab them them really quickly. But yeah, we have actually, we've seen them them feed, mostly for the smaller ones, they're feeding on, on little tadpoles. But yeah, we've actually been able to watch them diving into the water oh. to, to grab see. those tadpoles. I know what I was going to ask you. You were talking about venom. And what about spider bites? Is that something that we should be worried about when we're near a spider? For the most part, no. Spiders are very shy organisms. And really, they're not trying to come into contact. So again, for a lot of them, they either have very good vision, so they can tell that you are a lot bigger than they are, or they can tell from your vibrations that they are a lot bigger th than you are. And so spider bites are defensive. So they are biting because they don't know what else to do, and they are trying to make you leave them alone. Um, and so for the most part, people are very seldom bitten. If, when I am out in the field with spiders, I will easily pick up any spider in my hand. And as long as I'm not um, trying to grab it or, or hold it in any make it way, it will just walk across my hand and never had a problem w with being bitten. But the, the problems tend to occur if you're ever trying to subdue it in any manner, mm. then it is going to have this defensive response, which its defense mechanism is to, to bite. But there are very, very few in the US aggressive spiders that will automatically just bite. And so most of the time when, when people do have some sort of raised welt and they think it's a, a spider bite, they actually don't see the spider. And it, it's just an automatic response because they don't know what bit them just to blame it on a spider. And it's probably but some kind of insect, I mean, a flying. Most probably. There's yeah. so many things out there that, that will bite. And again, whether it's they're actually feeding on you or whether it's a defensive response, there's no way to know. And actually, unless you actually see it happening, there's no way to know what it might be. Um, I had an experience just the other day. I stepped on a actually quite large spider, and um, I was barefoot. Uh, and I thought for sure it would get squashed, and it just ran right off. And I thought, oh my goodness. It, number one, I didn't hurt it, which is surprising. But number two, it didn't. I didn't feel anything. It didn't try to bite me. So. Right. Right. And that that just usually, wanted to get away. <laughs> right. That is their first response is that they will try and run away. But uh -huh. when they are cornered and there is no other response, that's the only times that they really will bite. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I I honestly can't say that I have seen a spider that I have been even manipulating. I have never had one bite me, even as I am holding it and and looking at it. It's funny, um, once I got started doing this, getting ready for the show, it seemed like there were spiders everywhere. And suddenly I'm noticing them everywhere. And um, right now there's a beautiful one on my porch. It's, and it's huge. 
Um, I was trying to figure out what spider it might be, and this book is really great. Um, we need to tell people how to get it. It's uh, go to wildohio.com. Right. Uh, because one thing, it's got pictures where it shows how big the spider is, and right. I have a feeling it's the variable orb weed weaver, and it just says that it's it's on porches frequently, right? With huge webs, right? And it's been there for a couple days. It's Right. It's almost like my pet. I think he knows that I'm his friend. <laughs> right. And actually, and so most of the time, I, I will mention, most of what you are going to see, those are females. And oh, the, really? the, the other thing is that, you know, we're always in the habit when we see something we don't know, we usually call it a he. Most of the spiders, oh. especially the big orb weavers, are going to be female. Okay. So, like Charlotte. Uh, right. To remember. So, but yeah, and they are beautiful, and they do build these big, beautiful webs. And it really is fun just even to watch them build yes. those webs, because oh, those webs are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, you pointed out on this walk that we did at the botanical gardens, um, I think it was the, I'm not sure if it was the orchard spiders or whatever, but they had webs that were amazingly intricate, um, so close together, the silk. Right. Like a millimeter or something, and it was all perfect. And you said something about they use their legs to measure? Right. So, you know, there's been a lot of work looking at how are spiders, because when you look at these orb webs, they do very often seem so perfect. And how yeah. is it that these spiders are, are doing it? And so some of the research suggests that, that they are using measurements to determine where to lay those threads. And essentially, what are they going to be using? Using, they use their body parts, so either their abdomen or the lengths of their legs, that determine how and where they place that, that web, which is why you see such a regular arrangement of these threads. So there definitely is some sort of measurement that, that is involved with these spiders as they're spinning that web. Well, I think they're wonderful, fascinating, and I think, um, you know, one of the main things I hope people get out of today's um, conversation is that they don't need to kill a spider every time they see one, right? Absolutely. And so how can they uh, make their yards more friendly for spiders? So lots of different things. For my yard, obviously, that's something that, that I am very interested in doing. So a lot of the plants that, that I plant are, are insect attractants. Not only do I enjoy seeing the, the insects, but this is also a, a food source um, for, for spiders. So I really like a lot of different types of, of plants that, that draw in the, the insects. The other thing that is, is really important is structure. So a lot of spiders, if they're building web, they have to be different types of structures. So, Diversity. so having, right, Right. So having some variety in there and different sizes of, of things is, is really important. And of course, one of the biggest problems for spiders is, is any sort of insecticide. Mm. So this impacts them not only if the spray gets on them, it's going to impact them, but also the insects that they are eating. Again, as a top predator, there's what we call bioaccumulation. So those toxins are in the prey that they are eating. So then they get very, very mm. heavy doses of these toxins. And it's really been shown that different types of toxins affect their ability to build webs, oh, yeah. which means that they're not able to catch prey as efficiently, as well as uh, impacting their behavior. So neurologically, they're, they're actually not able to, to capture. They can't move as well. And it's also be shown to have some effects on the development of their reproductive organs. Oh. So then mm -hmm. long term, these spiders are not able to, to mate either. So yeah, so for the most part, and again, I feel that if I have the spiders in my yard, they are taking care of most of the pest species. So you know, even around my vegetable garden, I try to make sure that I have and even bring in different spiders so that they are, are within there. And some of the, the ancient Chinese uh, mechanisms for, for having spiders, they will actually provide refugia. So you can actually create little areas where spiders can hmm. stay. And so very often you can just put in like a clump of hay. So very often in agricultural fields, you know, every once a year you're getting rid of all of that vegetation and there's no way for spiders to, to be. So one thing is to actually have little areas of, of hay or some sort of vegetation that doesn't get removed every year from vegetable patches. And this is where the spiders will, will stay, and, and very often some of the ambush spiders. And so they move out of this at night, and then they have a place to come back to during mm. the day um, that remains. That would be a paradigm shift for Americans. I think. Right. I've actually started catching spiders and taking them out of my house. Um, but we have to wrap up, unfortunately. It's been wonderful having you here today, Dr. Shillington. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, we're just going to quickly tell you that if you want to learn more about spiders, go to AmericanArachnology.org or BugGuide.net. Right? Yep. 
For an online archive of today's show, go to ewashna.org forward slash greenroom. Thanks for joining us here in the greenroom.